All right, hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesdays by Acumen. Today's webinar is going to be uh, Tips, Tricks, and Tools, Part 2. Part 1, we actually did a few weeks ago and, and can still be viewed on, the, on our YouTube channel. Just type in Acumen FL on YouTube to see that. Um, we're also going to be kind of introducing a new polling to this webinar. So this, we're going to launch three uh, quick questions on our, on our poll here. Uh, so if you could go ahead and take the time to just answer those, it's, it's super quick. They're all um, multiple choice questions. Um, and without further ado, um, here's Nick Nabozzi. Thanks, Max. Uh, and then we're just after some valuable feedback in that poll uh, from you guys. Make sure that you know we're, we're giving you the value you want with these types of webinars. So as Max said, this morning we're going to cover uh, the second part of the tips and tricks uh, presentation that uh, we've written over the years. All of our uh, listeners are in uh, kind of listen-only mode, and uh, but if you, you do have a question, by all means, please use the uh, chat or the Q&A, and we'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, get those questions answered. We'll be monitoring that, of course. Um, let me just open that up so Max can monitor it. Okay. So let's get going. Our, our goals, again, for this morning, we want to review some, some data entry tips, again, to help uh, kind of build efficiencies and, and reinforce some of the features in, in 300 that uh, have been there for a long time, uh, but some are kind of hidden, some are not as, as obvious. And we're also going to cover some uh, time-saving tools built by us, Acumen, our, our developers here, that we think can, uh, you know, would really, really help, uh, again, your users. So the one thing I'm going to do that I did cover last time is, is just very quickly talk about the data entry shortcuts. Um, this is a big one, I think, and, and I'm a huge fan of kind of moving away from the mouse and staying on your keyboard. So we did this before, but we'll go very quickly again and, and just kind of remind you. And I'm going to jump back and forth between the PowerPoint and Sage. So um, we're going to talk about Alt and the underlined letter, a way to kind of open screens or, or click around the screens without using your uh, mouse. We'll talk about the plus key in the numeric fields, and we'll talk about moving forwards and backwards in the screen, and then moving forwards and backwards in the tabs. So if I bring open Sage here for a moment, and I come into a screen here like my invoice entry screen, <coughs> and I open up one of my batches here. If I do Alt, you can see that the letters are underlined here, F for file, and T for the settings, uh, settings menu, and uh, H for help and S for save down at the bottom. So I can do all of those things here. If I want to go to the, the taxes tab, Alt X to take me there, Alt O to take me to the totals tab, Alt C to close this window. Alt. So you really can move around this screen very, very easily without, uh, you know, without grabbing that mouse and, and slowing yourself down. Um, we talked about using tab. Everyone should be comfortable doing that, uh, moving through the screens. Uh, but what you may not know is you can also do shift tab to move backwards through the screen so that's a backup field. Again, um, that really comes from the uh, kind of olden DOS days, but uh, again, keeps you faster when you're not grabbing for that mouse. When I'm in a numeric field, and that's any numeric field here, debits and credits or amount fields, I can launch the calculator by hitting my plus key. And I can do a calculation, you know, and figure out what that value is. And I can do Alt P and paste that back in and paste that value into the screen. So I can open this up. I can do calculations, multiply things, figure out my values, and then just paste that back in quickly into that screen. Now, <clears throat> whenever I have a uh, something uh, like a toggle, an on and off or a yes or no, I can use my space bar to turn that on and off. So as I'm tabbing through that field, you know, I can tick things on and off with my space bar. That's very popular in bank recs when I'm saying reconciled, yes, 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 yes. I can use my arrow keys in that to, to move through that very quickly. Uh, also when I'm in my kind of payment entry screen and I'm picking invoices to pay, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay. Um, in my finders now, let's talk about uh, 
launching my finder, launching my uh, my kind of zoom keys, and just some of that those F keys or those function keys and, and what they do. Now, in my finder, when I open that up, I can launch that uh, with F5. So I do not have to, again, click on my finder. Uh, I can do that by launching with my F5 key here. Inside my finder, I can control how things look here with my settings columns menu. And if, if there's some piece of information you don't see and you want to put into your finder, you can scroll through the unselected section here. If I want to see my vendor's terms, I can move that over. And if I want to see what, what tax group they're in, I can move that over. Then I can come over and use the up or down button here to move that accordingly. Maybe that's really important to me, so I like to see that in the beginning. Now, when you change a finder or anytime you change your screen or add something to your screen, it's stored for you and you only. So uh, you're not changing anything for anyone else. When you log into Sage as yourself, it looks the way you do. And what's nice about it is it's um, that's kind of site-wide. So you know, if I happen to be logging in as Nick on Max's machine, as soon as I log into Sage as Nick, uh, it remembers the way I left it and not the way he does. So I can make it uh, really look and feel the way I want it to, to be. <laughs> Okay, let's get into some now part two pieces, right? And, and let's talk about some transactions. Now, in the general ledger, we're gonna talk about the reverse entry button. And it's something that's been there for a long time, uh, but it's not always obvious. And sometimes our, our consultants show it and people go, holy cow, I wish I would have known that, uh, you know, six months ago before I did all these exports and imports or had to fix a problem. Uh, we're going to talk about what quick mode means. We're going to look at setting up recurring entries in the system uh, and then talk about auto create accounts and then some drill down uh, and, and some information on, on where that comes from and, and what uh, you know what's involved with that. So let's go over to our general ledger here and let's go into our batch list. And I'm going to open this up and I'm going to come and find a posted batch. So my reverse button only shows when I have a posted batch. So here's a, a posted batch. Uh, here's one that has four entries in it and it has posted successfully. There are no errors over here. So I'm going to go ahead and open this batch up. It came from the US payroll module and let's take a look at it here. Okay. Now at the bottom of the screen, if, if I've made a mistake in one of these entries in here and I need to easily reverse it, right? As you know, there's a rock solid audit trail in Sage, so you cannot delete it. I cannot change a posted entry, everything's sprayed up. But now because this is posted, I can come down and click on my reverse button here. And I can say, okay, it says, do you want to reverse entry number one? or do you want to reverse the entire batch, number nine, which would be all four entries, and I can choose which one I want to. I can pick which batch I'd like to put that reversal in, or I can create a new one at the time. And I like to say reverse batch from batch nine, and I can, I can change my description here. So if I do the entire batch, I have a choice of, of also editing automatically the entry description, and you might put an entry, a prefix in with reversal or something like that. Okay, I'm just gonna do one, and we'll kick process here, and let that run. And it says, I've gone ahead and put all 32 of those transactions in batch 244 for you. So I can come and look at that entry, and then I can post it, and now I have a, a direct reversing entry. Now my fiscal period obviously has to be open to do that. Uh, if I want to post back to that period, and I can control that with the fiscal calendar, but I can reverse that into the current period if uh, you know if I need to. Okay. Now <clears throat> one other quick thing on reversing is uh, sometimes we'll get questions about uh, you know I have 32 lines in here and, and I only really made a mistake on on this one line here. Can I fix that? And you know unfortunately you can't, but Sometimes we'll say, go ahead and reverse that, and then reverse the reversal. And what you end up with is an unposted original batch 
that you can then change, you know, fix this GL account or fix this description here and then post. So just a kind of a neat way, I think, to think about doing a reversal. You can reverse the reversal once it's posted, of course, and then you're, you're left with really an unposted original batch. Okay, let's talk about quick mode for a moment and why that's important here. We've probably all seen this as we've been doing journal entries throughout the, you know, throughout the system. And I'll put in my JE here. And right here is, is the entry mode and, and it's defaulted to normal mode. But if I turn it on to quick mode here, what that does for me is anything I type in my reference and description fields here, copy down for me. So if I put the $100 in here to debit my petty cash account and I hit insert, you know, it automatically will copy those down for me. And that's important because, uh, you know, when we're, we're going to look at drill down in a moment and see where everything comes from, but um, a lot of clients like to put detail in there so that when I get over to my financials and I drill down or I'm, I'm in my chart of accounts and I drill into a particular transaction and I see that, you know, and with Sage Intelligence now with the ability to drill back to transactions, you know, that information is available to you. So now it's, that's an easy way to get it, uh, you know, populated on every line of your entry without, again, retyping everything. And that's our goal today is really to, to get you faster uh, and get, you know, the same, if not better information. Okay. Now, recurring entries, right, are in the system here <coughs> underneath GL Setup. Now, recurring entries are, are nothing more than a GL journal entry with a schedule. But I like to use these for anything uh, that I need to process on a regular basis. And it, it can be monthly entries, quarterly, annual, even weekly if you want to. And, and we'll talk about that very quickly and show you how to set something up. So if I look at maybe a rent expense here from a prepaid account, this is something set up in sample data, really the, the power of it here is this schedule. You know, the rest of it looks just like a journal entry. You have a source code, you have normal or quick mode, you have your detail lines, of course, and it can also be an auto-reversing recurring entry. But the schedule here, if we zoom in for a moment, this is what allows me to say, okay, is this gonna be a, you know, every four days or every three weeks or every three months, you know, whatever you want to set up. And then of course, just like we saw in the first part, I can use that that reminder function of the schedule to say I want to remind a specific user that it's time to run, you know, your uh, uh, specific entry, you know, time to process your rent entry or your payroll import or whatever you want to do. So um, we see we get lots of calls on, on can we can we import these or how do you store or how do you set up recurring entries. So I want to just take a couple minutes to talk about that. It's really nothing more than a journal entry with a schedule attached to it. But that schedule provides some, some pretty good functionality. Okay, next is something called create accounts. And this probably won't be something for everyone, but we do have lots of clients that uh, you know, add a department or add a new entity or, or whatever that segment means for your organization. If you add a new one, you can, of course, export and import here, you know. So let's say we, we look in our chart of accounts and we'll come down to the sales section here. And I have accounts with dash 100, dash 200, dash 300, and I have dash 10, 20, and 30, and 40 behind that. So I have three segments in here. And let's say I wanted to, you know, set up a new one. Well, uh, you can, of course, export and import that, as we said, and, and work in Excel. But there's a nice tool here called Create Accounts where I say, okay, I wanna create an account with the divisional structure here, and, and we, you would go ahead and pick your structure code so it knows what type or what length uh, of accounts to make. And you wanna say, okay, I'm gonna create some with the same. And then how do you wanna find which ones to copy? So, you know, I may say, okay, I wanna select all the ones in a particular division 100 here. And now I can come down to the bottom and say, okay, I wanna create a new one, yes or no. Do I just need to populate all of the 100s for 300? I could do that. 
do I want to create a new one? And, and perhaps I want to do 400. So I can go ahead and, and use this tool here to populate all of, uh, all of the accounts for me. So I'm going to go ahead and set up a new segment 400 very quickly so we can take a look. And now I can put in 400. I'm going to copy all my defaults from the 100 account that it finds. And if I go ahead and preview, it found 41 accounts for me to, to create. And I get my listing. And had I typed new very, a little bit cleaner, it would have looked very nice. <laughs> but I can come through and say yes or no. Again, I can use my space bar, right, and turn things on and off if I don't want everything, or maybe it doesn't have this particular type of expenses or, or these. Uh, you know, this section of revenue I can leave off. And when I'm ready, I can print this, I can look at the optional fields, make sure they're set up and they're all accurate or, or change them. Uh, and I can uh, go ahead and process when I'm ready and it will go through and very quickly make all those accounts for me. Again, a, a pretty good time saver. Uh, probably not every client would use that, but certainly our, our clients that do, you know, add departments, change things, want to, you know, want new uh, sections or properties or divisions. And again, that can be anything for you, um, but that's very powerful and, and very fast to do. And I love that it has a preview first, so I can take a look and uh, see what it's going to do before it does. If I completely mess up and, and, you know, I can click clear here, clear it out and start over. So as long as I don't process it, you know, there's, there's nothing, uh, you know, nothing changed in the system. Okay, now we're gonna, I wanna point this out for just a moment here and talk about drill down uh, because we're gonna look at this in, in our subledger modules in just a moment here. So uh, maybe let's look at accounts receivable trade for a moment and we'll come down to our transactions here. And as I start to drill down, you know, I have a reference and description. So I have here, looks like my customer number, my customer name, type of document and document number. So I just want to, we're going to review, you know, how that gets there and where that comes from for a moment. But that's a, a very important thing that we get lots of questions on. Well, you know, I've drilled down and I don't quite get the information I need. And we're going to talk about that today when we get over to payables and receivables. Okay. <clears throat> now, because we're talking about transactions, I want to point out one other thing in the general ledger for a moment here and we'll go into our accounts to do so. And on a particular account here, and this is true for any account in the system, you have the ability to turn on something called maintain quantities. And now if I turn this on here, I can set up uh, the unit of measure for that particular account, and it can be different for different accounts. So for sales, I might say, you know, number of transactions or something like that. Um, and I want to now look at, okay, I want to compare gross margin and, and while revenue is really up, did we, you know, was our pricing going up? Did we have more transactions? You know, so I get some, some information or insight into, you know, why. What's really nice about that is once I turn that on, when I'm doing a journal entry, I can import these, of course, if I want to, but I can also bring these in here to my quantity field. So I can say, okay, we had 5,700 <clears throat> transactions for this particular month, this period, this year, whatever uh, duration you wanna, you wanna do. A lot of clients will put these in monthly so that when I run my monthly financials, I can add them up and I can look at year to date and do those types of, uh, you know, that type of analysis. Now, um, because it's a quantity, I don't have to have a balanced debit and, and credit in here. You know, I'm, I'm not putting that in, so I can just put quantities in. So we see things like square footage or headcount, number, uh, number of people in a particular department. We see number of transactions. Uh, we've even built some Sage Intelligence reports to help calculate some of those things and import those straight into, uh, into the system for you. Just like a journal entry import, it would be a quantity version of a journal entry import. So again, that's powerful because it, it ultimately ends up in your financial statements if you want to and, and really helps with that variance analysis piece of things. Okay, now let's go over to our accounts payable section here for a moment.
And we're going to talk about a few things here. We're going to talk about our payment batches being created automatically. We're going to talk about um, how to remove entries and, and details from the batch you don't want to pay. So we'll go through that whole process. We still see a lot of clients uh, out there kind of setting up manual payment batches and, and really doing lots of data entry. So I'd like to show you another option. Um, and then we're going to talk about reversing multiple payments and uh, also quick entry mode and, and what that means. It's something that's really hidden. I know we cover it in training, but uh, it's not always uh, easy to find. So, <clears throat> okay, let's take a look. So when I'm processing a payment batch, right, we all put our bills in and our invoices in, and unfortunately, then we have to pay them. So we, you're probably all familiar with this payment batch list. I can click new. I can start a batch. I can pick which bank I'm going to do and then start to go through entry by entry. Pick my vendor. I'm going to do chloride. Hit go. I'm going to pick my invoices here. Again, remember, I can use my space bar because that's a toggle, yes or no. And I can add it and do the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Well, that's kind of the, the slow way, right? And, and that's not something in our tips and tricks class. So what's a what's a possibly a possible better way well if we come over here <clears throat> to our create payment batch option and i say okay go ahead and pick my selection code and a selection code is just going to pick pull up some defaults when we pick which bank i want maybe set some of my criteria or set some exclusions for me i just did all vendors so we can kind of show something here and that says okay what's my batch date what's my payment date what bank do I want to pay from? Should I select only vendors that are defaulted to this bank code? And then really over here, I can set some criteria and say, okay, pay everything that's on, let's do on or before, you know, say 12, 31, 2020 here, just so we get something. But I can also take into account discounts, right? I can open this up and say, maybe I pick a date and then I put my discount in because I'm going to do everything that's due on or before my next check run but show me anything that might have a discount for the next, the following check run, because I may want to include that today to take advantage of that early payment discount. So you, you can use that and, and factor that in as well. I can do just a, a range of, of vendors here, you know, maybe just my trade vendors or my inventory vendors if I want to. I can also come over and exclude certain vendors and say, I know I'm not going to pay, you know, DECA management company. We're in dispute with them or, or, or something like that, or you know, we're, hold, we're on hold for whatever reason, so I can exclude them. Now at the bottom, I can say, okay, let's generate a register, and this will print a report for me that I can look at and see what I'm expected to pay. This is all working now on, you know, using the invoices that I've entered uh, with the terms code, with the invoice data, and calculating what a due date should be. But I like that report a lot, uh, it does tell me my totals, but what I like even better is to just go ahead and generate it. And what it's going to do is say, okay, I've created all the payments that I've found that should be paid now based on your criteria and put them into batch 29 for me. And it's not a posted batch, it's, it's unposted, right? So I can come over here and open up this batch and I see that I have 21 entries here totaling $52,854. And now because this is not posted, you know, I still have the ability to come through and edit this. So I could come down here and say, okay, we're going to go ahead and pay chloride systems vendor here, but we're not going to pay this $5,900 invoice at the end. So I'm just going to delete that line from this particular entry and save it. And I'm going to go to the next one and say, oh, yep, yep, we're going to pay everything for Exide. You know, they're a great vendor. We want to get them paid. Uh, coastal heating, actually, we're not going to pay at all. So I'm going to hook down here, click on the delete button, and delete entry number three. So that's going to delete the entire entry. So now I can just quickly scroll through. I don't have to add every single invoice we want to pay. I can pull things out that I don't want to pay, which is a lot faster, and scroll through. And so once I pull something out of here, if I either delete that invoice or I delete the entire entry, it just puts them back into the open payables bucket. And it's, um, you know, really 
really out there ready for the next one. So there's, there's really no harm in pushing it right over to the batch. And, and that's why I like to do that generate button right away. I can always print my batch listing from here, which also shows me, you know, what's in it. I can see my total quickly up at the top and see what's, uh, you know, out there to be paid. Okay. So that, when we show that, uh, you know, often clients really like that because it, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you and allows you to, um, you know, speed up that process and, and not have to manually enter every single invoice to be paid. And just a, again, a reminder, we want to make sure we pay attention to terms codes and, and due dates and things like that. If you're going to use this, uh, that's important because that's how it calculates when something should be due. And then lastly, I can go in to something called control payments here. And I can pick either a single document or a range of documents for a particular vendor. And I can force something to be paid or I can put something on hold or I can change the due date or the discount date and say go and say, okay, remember I can't change anything that's posted, right? I, I can't break any of my audit rules, but I could say oh, they've called and offered me a discount if I pay early, you know, that, that's something that could happen or I may want to force this which means the next time I do a payment batch, it's going to be selected automatically for me because it's forced into my payment uh, process. So again, you, you do have a way to kind of uh, you know, go in and, and, and automate or, or change values on certain invoices or again, ranges of, of invoices for a particular vendor or a group of vendors. Okay, so that's the control payment process. And that's something that really can, can speed things up. Now let's go up into invoice entry for a moment here. And let's talk about something called quick entry mode. And this is really, in my opinion, hidden. <laughs> and up at the top here under settings is where I have quick mode here or quick entry mode. Now this is really helpful uh, if I'm sitting down at month end and I have a bunch of invoices for the same vendor or for the same department or the same function or the same job. So I have some settings, right, or data entry fields here that I can turn on at the header for the entry or for the detail lines or both. So as I'm going through, if, if I want to copy my header description over for every entry, I can do that. If I want to, if I have the same vendor, I can copy that over. If I'm posting back to last month and I want the document date and posting date to just copy over, you know, I can set those so that every time I click add and it makes a new one, those will be set for me. Uh, so I'm, you know, maybe I'm using, I'm putting in cell phone bills and, and we use the account number as the document number and I put one, two, three at the end of it. So maybe I want the document number to copy through. So, you know, those are all at the, the header level. And then here are description things. So again, if I'm posting to the same GL account or if it's, you know, if I put the same comment in or the same description over here and I want those to copy across, I can put that in and, um, you know, those will copy to every single entry in this particular batch. And it will stay that way and, and re remember that until I turn it off. So I do have to turn it off if I don't want that to happen uh, each time. Okay. So again, that's not something you'd probably turn on or use all the time, but you would uh, definitely, uh, you know, if I'm sitting down, like I said, to do a bunch of invoices at month end or something, um, you know, a bunch of invoices for the same vendor uh, or the same GL code or the same department, and I want that to copy through, you know, that can really save some time as well. So that's, that's available in both payables and receivables. And again, it's up in the settings menu here, and it's called quick mode. You'll see that same exact thing in the AR screen as well. Okay, now we talked about drilling down, right, and, and filling the uh, GL description and, and, and GL reference fields. Well, let's just do a quick reminder on, on how those values get there. Uh, we get lots of questions on this. Our, our support team, uh, you know, answers this, this question quite often. Well, each of the sub-ledger modules, payables, receivables, bank, inventory, order entry, purchase orders, they have a button here under setup called GL integration. And here on the transactions tab, 
and I'll just make this a little bit bigger, is where I can set or control which information is pushed over uh, to the general ledger for each transaction type. And remember, everything ultimately ends up as a journal entry, right? An invoice ends up as a journal entry, a payment becomes a journal entry. And when we saw our journal entry there, I have a description at the entry level, and I have a reference, a description, and a comment at the detail level. And so here I could say, okay, for an invoice, I wanna push over the description, or maybe I wanna push over the description, the, maybe the batch number and the description or something like that. So I can pick what information I want to push from this module over to the general ledger automatically. So when you're drilling down, and if you're not seeing information that would be really helpful to you, maybe you get the vendor number, but you don't know that and you'd prefer the vendor name to come across, you know, you could come over and say, okay, I don't really care about the vendor number, so I'm gonna pull that out and, and the vendor name, it gives me a little bit more room. You know, it's, it's not an unlimited field, it's still a 60 character field, so you probably don't wanna turn everything on, uh, but you can control what information comes across. You know, our consultants have a lot of uh, uh, suggestions here for you, and, and when we do brand new implementations, you know, we, we set these to kind of the most popular things, but you know, we can also help change these or, or get these uh, set up or configured the way you, you need them and want them. It is not a retroactive change, so when you change it, it's, it's only for new postings going forward. Okay, let's talk about accounts receivable now. And a couple of things here in AR. So customer credit checks, <clears throat> uh, if I want to, this is something I can turn on. This is really more for some of our distributor or distribution type clients, our service clients that run things like service manager, order entry, uh, you know, billing on a job cost and those types of things. I could turn it on where I can have the system stop me and, and perform a credit check and make sure that uh, you know I'm not, not selling something to a customer that's going to cause me uh, you know a loss or something like that. You can do customer refunds in accounts receivable. This has been in here for quite a few years now, and we just don't see it um, you know as often uh, as you know we think we should. Uh, not that everyone really want we don't want everyone out there cutting checks and refunds, <laughs> but rather than setting up a customer as a vendor and uh, you know kind of do miscellaneous payments, you can cut checks directly out of AR. So if it, if it fits your industry and fits your business practice or processes, you know that might be a good way to do it. We already saw quick entry mode, but that's here as well. And then I want to talk about posting journals and errors here. And I'll show you this is available in AP and GL as well, but we'll talk about it here in accounts receivable. Okay, so here in accounts receivable, let's talk about our customers, as we said here. And we'll pull up my favorite customer, Mr. Ronald Black. And we'll come over and look here at our processing tab. And down at the bottom here, I can say, okay, do I want the system to issue a credit warning when my total outstanding balance exceeds my credit limit? So I can set a credit limit. This will default from my customer group that Mr. Ronald Black is in or this particular customer's in, um, but I can always override it, right? It's always set at the customer level or I can turn that on. I can also say, and or, when there's AR transactions overdue by a number of days. So even if they're not at the limit yet, but they haven't paid everything uh, for 60 days, or you know, it, it over, it's, uh, exceeds an overdue limit of, of 5K. So even though they haven't hit their $20,000 credit limit, you know, they owe us 5K over 60 days, and, and so we're gonna put them on stop. So by turning that on, and you, you can see I can do that customer by customer. So you know, you may never put your best customer on hold. That's just not something you want to do and, and upset them because you know they're going to pay. They're just slow. You got to remind them, you know, but you can turn this on, you know, customer by customer here. So that's, once that's turned on, that will flow through to the other modules. So I'll see that in sales order entry. I would see that in, you know, something like a service manager by Technosoft, uh, you know, other third-party applications as well can use that credit limit uh, and credit warning.
Okay, we said customer refunds, right? <clears throat> so if I do a refund here and I turn on the, say I'm going to use refunds, you'll see that I have a refund batch list here that works just the same as invoices and, and receipts and, and payments and AP, but I can come in and start a refund batch here. So we'll go ahead and open up my refund entry. And I can see here that for this particular customer, Canem Industries, I'm going to process a refund for this particular credit note for $162.38. So I can select, uh, you know, I, I have a transaction, obviously a refund number. I can give this to the customer. Uh, does the customer, did they get cash? Did they get a, a check? Or is it going back on a credit card if I'm using something like, you know, Sage Payments or Pi or something like that? And it's integrated. Uh, and I can actually do my check payment right from here. And I can say, uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut you a check. So I can process this directly from accounts receivable. If I do that and I'm going to cut checks from AR, uh, we would probably need to set up an AR check spec for you. You probably all have AP check specs. Um, they probably look the same, but we just want to make sure you have the right form and everything looks good for you. Uh, but it is a way to do uh, checks or refunds directly from AR. You can keep AP you know, doing what they need to do. You don't have to have customers set up again in AP because I can, I can cut this directly uh, to my customer. I can also control this by security. So of course, you may turn refunds on but not give that ability to everyone for you know, obvious reasons. Uh, so you can control this completely by uh, security rights uh, here in AR. Okay, now, <clears throat> lastly here in accounts receivable, we want to go into the batch list. And we'll talk about something that, uh, again, is a tip that we, we like to point out and we don't see used all of the time here. So on the right-hand side of the screen here is there's two columns here in my batch list, one called posting sequence and one called number of errors. Well, um, from here directly from a batch list, I can print my posting journal or my posting errors report if there are any. You know, if there are any errors, I'll see that here. So I can double click and write on that number and I can print my posting journal from here and see what, what went into this entry, what was there, what's the journal entry that it's going to make. Now this is true for AR, AP, general ledger, any batch list that you see in the system, you can print my posting sequence from here. And probably more helpful, not something you do all the time, but if I did have an error, you know, even in the general ledger, I might double click on that to run my posting journal error report and see why I got that error, right? Because as we know, if there is an error batch created, it will successfully post everything that it can and then kick out the, the, the entry or entries or lines that it, that it couldn't post so that, uh, you know, this wasn't balanced or the, the fiscal period was locked or the customer's inactive. So that's a great way to figure out what the problem was and how to fix it because you don't have to re-enter it. You can just go and fix the problem in the error batch and repost it. And we get calls where someone had deleted an error batch and, and really that's, that's not something you want to do. You want to figure out what the problem is fix it, and then go ahead and post that error batch. Okay, moving on now to something called visual process flows. Visual process flows have been added uh, uh, quite a few years ago now. And uh, again, in, in my opinion, I don't see them used enough. So let's talk about what they are, uh, why to use them, and how to edit them if you want to use them. So here on the bottom of your tree, and you may not see it because you have to be assigned security to visual process flows, but what they've done is they've basically flattened out each of the modules here. So if I look at AP for a moment, and I see, okay, here I may want to give someone access to you know, a, a process in AP or even a part of AP. I want them to be able to enter invoices, make payments, run a few reports, Maybe not everything, you know, uh, so I can come in and, and give someone the screen or, or, or buttons to do something like this. Um, you can certainly edit these and we'll talk about that in a moment. So why would I use something like this? I think it makes it a nice, clean uh, experience for users so that they can kind of walk through your process. You can lay out, you know, what you want them to do 
and how you want them to interact with the system. And we've even gone so far for some users, you know, we'll drag this bar over and lock down their ability to, uh, you know, modify their desktop in Sage. And they log into a pretty nice clean screen that they use all day long, you know. Uh, okay, I'm going to enter my vendor invoices. Okay, it's going to bring open my AP invoice entry screen. You know, so of course I can do everything I need to from there, um, and I can set them up. So you can also do custom things, right? So maybe I want to right click and edit one of these, and when I do that, it opens it up in edit mode. And this is something, of course, we can help you, you know, get comfortable with. But I can go in and I can rename things. I can add new buttons to things. I can change things around. So you can add custom applications. So, you know, I can also save this and, and make a, you know, save this as a demo. And I'll save that. So I, I didn't break the original. I'm going to go ahead and save these out there. And they're all saved out on your server on your Sage uh, location. And then what you can do is something like this. This is one specific for some of our hospitality clients, but just to give you an idea, you know, we said, okay, I'll create uh, maybe a little dashboard for our hospitality GMs, and maybe they want to run the profit stage integration. So that's a custom application here, and they can open that up and it launches, you know, the Acumen profit sort integration thing, or maybe they want to connect to one of their vendors and pull that integration in or run a custom Sage intelligence report from here. So just to kind of give you an idea, of, I can put all kinds of different uh, things in. I need support from Acumen, so I want to launch directly to the Acumen support website or the, you know, log a ticket with them, something like that. So there's really no limit to what you can put in here. You can put buttons in. You know, we've had clients say, okay, here's what our year-end process looks like. So we made one called year-end, and I want our team to follow these three steps, and maybe they need these three or four reports to do so uh, to check things you know, when they're doing that. So it's a really nice user experience for your users. And, uh, you know, you can work with them and, and, and certainly we can help obviously to do that, but you can come in and, and uh, you know, put in custom logos. You can put in, you know, uh, custom applications, custom buttons like that to launch other things directly from your Sage desktop. Okay, now, Sage intelligence is the next thing we want to quickly talk about. And I'm not going to run reports or build reports or anything like that today, but I do want you to, to know about something that uh, is called the report utility. And that is um, available to everyone that has Sage intelligence. And I'm going to go out to my desktop for a moment here. And what that is, is a way to go out and launch um, or, or download reports rather. And where did my icon go? There it is, sorry, on my other monitor. So this is the Sage Intelligence Report Utility. And there's a small install that you have to run, and we can of course help you do this, but what's in here now are dozens and dozens and dozens of free reports that you can go download, again for free, that Sage has written or other people have written and, and Sage has tested and they put them all out here that you can pull into Sage Intelligence and use. And you can use them as is, you can use them as a starting point for, you know, you know, maybe you want to use it like this and add a couple columns. So the way it works is I say, okay, I want to pick this one, this one, and this one. I click download. Uh, and I wouldn't recommend doing, doing them all at the same time. I did that on a demo once and it took me about an hour, but <laughs> you, can, you certainly can bring them all down and, and take a look at them and test them all out. They show up ultimately here in intelligence reporting in my report manager section under a folder called new report. And you can see that I did in fact download all of them, but there are, Cash dashboards, there are, um, you know, Excel Power View and Power Pivot reports to analyze purchasing, there's customer dashboards, top salesperson, GL transaction listings, uh, job costing things, you know, a couple of additional financial reports, you know, sales analysis type things. So a lot of nice stuff and Sage keeps, uh, you know, adding to that all the time. So, you know, you can feel free to go out and, and download whenever you'd like. Uh, if you need 
help or you need you want to get that link uh, and how to install that you know just reach out to your account manager and, and we can help you get going with that okay and lastly we're going to close before we get to some Q&A with a couple of our acumen tools and, and now acumen tools are something that uh, I think a lot of you on the call know about but maybe not everyone uh, these are things that we offer uh, for a small subscription to our clients but our developers here you know have, have worked with Sage 300 or ACPAC for many many years and uh, we've, we've built these series of tools whether they're imports or, or report packs to really again make you more efficient and, and give you better information so we're just going to quickly show a couple a multi -journal, multi company journal entry import uh, something called the acumen payment grid which really helps kind of control uh, AP payments and, and allows you to set some additional criteria that you don't have out of the box. Uh, we'll talk about the AR aging report with comments and then something called the GL account update tool. So I'll just quickly go through that and, and kind of give you a flavor of those. And then, you know, certainly we'll answer some questions. So the multi-company GL import tool is exactly that. I may want to import my journal entry and maybe I'm sitting here and I have several SAGE databases. You know, I have 14 hotels or I have two legal entities and I don't want to log in and out of each one. I have to do a, a reclass here. Let me make this a little bit larger so we can all read it. So I'm going to do a reclass journal entry here and maybe I'm going to allocate some revenue out to different departments. So you can see here that I have Sample Company Inc. in the first few lines and Sample Company Limited here. So this is where my company would go. Uh, you know, I can put in my accounts, of course, and it will validate these for me. And then I can cut and paste. I can use Excel to, to calculate things for me. Remember, this is all Excel. So you can work in Excel, use the power of Excel. I can use, you know, another sheet to, to pull information in and, and do some formulas or some analysis if I want to. Uh, do I want to say this is an auto reversing entry? Should it post automatically or be left as unposted and ready for me to review? And I can click import and it's going to go ahead and log in to any or all of the companies I have. It's going to validate my information, make sure that I have the rights to do what I'm trying to do, that my accounts are open, my fiscal period is open, that my, my entries are balanced. And it's going to push these over to Sage for me and do that data entry. So when we see clients with multiple companies, you know, we have single company, of course, well, you know, that, that's really fast as well. But when we see multiple companies, you know, that can be really, really powerful. Uh-oh. <laughs> Probably don't have both my companies open here, but okay. So what I do then, I come over to my general ledger, and I can look here in my batch list, and I can open it up. And I can see here's my reclass, here's my allocation, and these are just the lines for Sample Company Inc., right? And my other ones would have went to Sample Company Limited. Okay, so again, that's just a, a really quick way to, to do journal entry imports across databases and allow you to use Excel to do calculations and, and figure out what that, what that entry should be. Now, if we talk about the acumen payment grid I'm going to come over to accounts payable here and this is something that again we would help you set up and I'm going to launch my our create payments tool here now this is a tool where um, we had some requests over the years to say okay uh, I want some additional functionality to that create payment batch we talked about before and I want to set optional fields for maybe types of, of vendors or, you know, I want to set up, okay, retail vendors, I'm only going to pay them today. And, and I'm going to say, okay, I want to pay my trade vendors, I'm going to pay from my, my CCC operating bank, and I'm going to do with checks here and select. And I'll just push my data out a little bit so I make sure I get some data and I'll say go. Let's go to other. Let me just relaunch that real quick. May have, may have paid them all in my uh, <laughs> prep for the demo. Okay. 
Turn off that, guys. Um, figure out why that one's not coming up. Unfortunately, I can't show that one at the moment. Um, it's going to pull through every single line here, every record that it says to be paid. Again, crossing companies. So I can see which company's in here, and then I can come to my paid column and pick what I want to, uh, to be paid and, and what I want to, uh, again, push out to the accounts payable payment batch. And then when I click create batch, it will go to any of my companies or any of my databases. Again, make sure I have rights to do so and, and create a payment batch for me over here in accounts payable in my payment batch list. Of course, it worked the entire time I was testing. And now that we're live, it did not. But it's going to look like this in admin payment batch. And I'll see that set up here. Okay, uh, next is something called uh, the accounts receivable aging with comments. So this is something we took, you know, a Sage Intelligence AR trial balance report, and we added some functionality in here uh, called comments. So again, this is just the aging, but maybe I want to do some collection notes and, and, and set these up and say, okay, here we're working on bargain mart. So I'm going to do control E and open up my comment field and uh, customer will pay on Friday. And I'll go ahead and save that, that comment here. Now what this does is saves this for me over here in my customer section, right? So if I come over and look at customer inquiry, and I pull up you know, any of my customers that I've put some comments on, and I look over at my comments tab here, I can see now that you know, I have aged comment types, and I can see by invoice or by transaction, so I can put comments on, on prepayments or anything like that, and they'll always show up here. And what's nice is that when I rerun an old aging, I can see comments from a, a prior period of time. So we have this for accounts receivable, we have this for accounts payable, uh, GL financial statements, you can do comments and see it's really powerful because I can put my notes in and, and store them and use them going forward. Okay, and then lastly, we'll talk about our GL account updater. And we get lots of, uh, you know, questions here uh, about, uh, you know, running financial statements by account and how can I quickly update my account groups on a particular GL account or set of accounts or, or grouping of accounts, right? So we built a tool. Again, I can work in Excel, so I can cut and paste. I can use other tabs to, to calculate some information, but, you know, I can paste in my accounts here. Uh, put in or select the account group that I want to I want to populate and again cross multiple companies here and Then go ahead and import and push this information up to uh, the other database Or or databases I should say Again, so that's just a, a flavor of some of the tools that we have built that are available for subscription in our, our acumen tool suite um, if you have any questions about those or would like to see more or want to see that payment grid, again, I apologize that um, wasn't working at the moment. Uh, of course, uh, never works when everyone's watching you, right? Um, but we're, we're happy to kind of show you that or, or you know, send you a screenshot of that if, if you'd like to take a look. So uh, with that, I think let's go ahead and open this up for questions. If you have anything in the chat that you, uh, you know, have a question about, uh, let's go ahead and uh, you know post it in now. I'm also going to um, uh, the polling has been closed. I appreciate everyone that uh, has answered for us so we can, uh, you know, get some good feedback for you. But thank you very much again for uh, attending, you know, webinar Wednesdays. And we'll stay on for a bit here if there's any questions that we can help answer. Okay, we got a question. Uh, how to copy and paste from the calculator field. Sure, so let's go over to, uh, say, our journal entry screen again. And again, this works in 
any field that is a numeric field in say 200. So I can be in the total amount or I can be in debits and credits here. So I'll pick an account and I'll come over to my debits here. And if I launch my calculator, so I'm doing the plus key or shift plus, you know, if I, if I don't have a number pad here and that launches the calculator automatically, then I can just do my calculation times 52 equals, you know, divided by 2.2, whatever that happens to be. And paste that in. I can do Alt-P or I can paste that right into the system. Okay, question, how do we go about getting access to the already built state intelligence report? So uh, go ahead and shoot an email over to us at uh, the, our account management team and that's am account management at acumenfl.com and we'll, we'll send you the instructions on how to install that little link and then of course our, you know, if, if you have questions or, or the technical team, you know, uh, your technical team can get with our consultants to, to help get that installed. There is a small little install that we have to do for you. Uh, how do we learn more about Acumen tools? <laughs> okay, um, I would say go ahead and re again reach out to your account manager. Um, we have documents, uh, you know, explaining what each acumen tool does, you know, and, and again, we're always happy to, to show you and discuss with you, you know, how we think it might help <coughs> and, uh, you know, where it might benefit you. And we're always coming out with uh, new ones. So we'll, we'll keep doing webinars like this to, to tell you about new things. Uh, what's nice is when you, when you go with the full bundle subscription, you know, all the new ones you're, you're able to get as well. So it, it just keeps getting better. Uh, question, okay, what is the next webinar? Oh, a good question, actually. Uh, the next webinar is uh, Wednesday, March 20th, uh, because it's webinar Wednesday, so it has to be on 20th. Uh, and we're actually going to show Sage Intact, which is Sage's uh, newest acquisition. It is a completely SaaS cloud-based application. Uh, and we're going to be kind of showing that and, and talking about some of the differences between uh, Sage Intact and Sage 300. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, I will uh, go ahead and uh, close with this then. You know, thank you again, as always, for your time and, and attending. Thank you for your feedback in our poll. Uh, we hope, you know, that this is truly valuable for you and we will, uh, you know, look through those results and, and make sure we're doing what you'd like to see. Um, one of the questions in the poll was, uh, you know, are you interested in finding out more about Sage Summit? And for those of you that said yes, you know, please, contact your account manager. We have a promo code that uh, we can send to you to get you a discounted registration. It is truly a good event uh, for customers to network with other customers, say, how are you doing this? How are you using this? There's training classes and, uh, you know, we can get you together and, and look at third party things and, and really just kind of see what Sage has to offer you. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attendance. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Have a great day, everyone.